Amen. So Judges chapter 7, we're continuing the story of Gideon, the Judge Gideon. We started uh, the story of Gideon in chapter 6, and the story continues in Judges chapter 7. So to recap, in Judges chapter 6, we see, you know, the calling of Gideon where the angel came and, you know, the prophet prophesied and then the angel came and talked to Gideon and, you know, he, he calls Gideon into action and the first thing that he does is he tells, you know, now the Israelites at this time of Gideon are, they're under oppression again from the Midianites and from all these other nations, but he, the angel calls Gideon into action and the first thing he has him do, of course, is tear down the altar of Baal because the children of Israel have turned against um, the Lord, and he tears down the altar of Baal, by the way, that was his, his dad's altar to Baal, you know, his, his dad had a, it was in his father's backyard, basically, so he does this, and then basically the Midianites and all these other nations come, they hear about this, it causes a great stir, and they bring this great army to destroy Israel, to destroy um, what Gideon has done, he's revolted against the, the, the nation that is oppressing them. Okay, so look at Judges chapter 7 and verse number 1, and the story continues. And the Bible says, Then Jerubbabel, who is Gideon, and all the people that were with him, rose up early and pitched beside the well of Herod. And, that, and the host of the Midianites, that means the army of the Midianites, were on the north side of them by the hill of Morah in the valley. And the Lord said unto Gideon, The people who were with thee are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hands, lest Israel vaunt themselves against me, saying, Mine own, hath has, my own hand has saved me. So a couple things here. First of all, you know, just picture the scene. This huge army is in the valley, and where are the Israelites living? You know, they're up in the mountains and the caves and the rocks. They've been, you know, pushed out of their villages, right? If you remember um, Judges chapter 6, and this is common, for people when they were oppressed, and we saw that in some of the earlier chapters in Judges, that people just, it, could, it was not safe to live in the villages. They were under too much oppression, and they went and they fled to the mountains. Okay, so now we have this huge army that comes into the valley. You think about the valley we live in. We live in this valley, the mountains are right there. It's a very good picture for us to, um, to see. It would be like the army being in Fresno and everybody else, you know, the, the children of Israel living up at Shaver Lake, basically. And, you know, that's the difference there. Okay? So look at um, verse number two. The Lord says something here. He says that the people that are with thee are too many for me. So this is very interesting here, okay? As, the, as we start out this chapter, you know, basically, can you really, when you're going to war, can you really have too many people? Can you say, I have too many soldiers right now? I mean, but that's exactly what God is saying here, is he's saying that the Lord is, you know, the Lord says there's too many people with you, Gideon. And he says, why? He says, because I don't want you to say that you saved yourself. I want you to be able to say that I saved you. So, it's interesting because this is the first, now we're seeing that Gideon's faith is being tested in Judges chapter 7. And this is the first time that it's tested. Look at verse number 3. Now therefore, so God is saying you have too many people, so I want you to do this. And in verse number 3 it says, Now therefore, go to proclaim in the ears of the people, saying, Whosoever is fearful and afraid, let him return and depart early from Mount Gilead. And there returned to the people 20 and 2,000, and there remained 10,000. So let's do some math. 22,000 left, and there remained 10,000. So if you add, you know, 10,000 plus 22,000, there was 32,000 people to begin with. And, you know, God said, find out who's afraid and just let them go back home. So they take a survey or whatever and ask, hey, whoever's afraid can go back home. And 22,000 of the 32,000 are like, yeah, we'll leave. We'll be out. Right? So basically, two-thirds of the people were fearful and afraid. That was most of the people. Okay? Now look, <clears throat> most people are afraid. I mean, that's pretty much uh, the, the lesson here. And you can see that even with the saved people of God here, that there's a lot of people that were afraid. Okay? Now look, the Bible does say that it's, it's fear. I mean, it's, it's a sin to be afraid. I mean, Revelation 21, 8, how many times have you read that out soul winning? Where does it start out with? The fearful and unbelieving. It says it's the fearful and unbelieving. Being fearful and unbelieving go together. Okay, those two are attached to each other. If a saved person is fearful, it's because of their unbelief. It's lack of faith. It doesn't mean they're not saved. It's just unbelief. It's not, you know, it's not trusting totally in, you know, that God can get you through the situation or whatever. We talked about this on Sunday morning. So, look, we just see an example here 
of, you know, most people being afraid in this situation. Okay? And look, I mean, you could say the same thing about our country today. If you ask me, you know, what's the biggest surprise that you had in 2020, I would tell you that so many people in this country are afraid. I mean, I never would have thought. I never would have thought that there's so many people who are afraid. But it's true. It's unfortunate. Okay? But fearful goes along with being unbelieving. So it does make sense according to the Bible. Okay? So look, the fearful and the fearful people, they leave. Now we're down to 10,000 people. He just lost two-thirds of his army. Look at verse number four. The Bible says, And the Lord said unto Gideon, The people are yet too many. Bring them down under the water, and I will try them for thee there, and it shall be that of whom I say unto thee, this shall go with thee, the same shall go with thee. And of whomsoever I say unto thee, this shall not go with thee, the same shall not go. So he brought down the people under the water, and the Lord said unto Gideon, Everyone that lappeth of the water with his tongue, as a dog lappeth, him shall thou set by himself. Likewise, everyone that boweth down upon his knees to drink. And the number of them that lapped, putting their hand to their mouth, were three hundred men. But all the rest of the people bowed down upon their knees to drink water. And the Lord said unto Gideon, By the three hundred men that lapped will I save you, and deliver the Midianites into thine hand, and let all the other people go every man unto his place. So basically, God says, let everybody go down and get a, uh, you know, a drink of water. And everybody that got down to the water and used their hand to put water in their mouth, he says, those are the people that are going to go with you. And that was only 300 of the 10,000. The other people just you know, got down on their hands and knees and just drank right out of the water. Okay, so look, he, he, he narrows it down to 300 people. Okay, now this is the second test of Gideon's faith. Now look. Who was testing who in, in Judges chapter 6, if you remember? I mean, there was two, you could argue, three times that Gideon literally tested the angel. He tested God. He said, no, show me a sign, he said. And he tested God to see if that's what, you know, if, if he could believe what this angel was telling him. But now we see that God is testing Gideon here. And he tested him again. So now he's down from 32,000 people down to 300 people. Okay, look at Judges chapter 7 and verse number 8. So these 300 people are going forth to conquer the Midianites, which are, you know, a lot more than 300 people. The Bible says, so the people took victuals in their hand. Now look, victuals are not weapons. Okay, victuals are, you know, their, their goods, their food, their their, you know, their, their little knapsack. You ever seen the kid with the, you know, he's, he's going into town or whatever, and he's got the little knapsack of his stuff, you know, in the older books? That, that's victuals. It's your supplies. Okay? So they didn't take their, their weapons. I'm not saying they didn't have weapons, but it certainly doesn't mention any weapons here. Okay? It took victuals in their hand and their trumpets, and he set all the rest of Israel, every man, unto his tent, and retained those 300 men. And the host of Midian was beneath him in the valley. And it came to pass that same night... But the Lord said unto him, Arise, get thee down unto the host, for I have delivered it into thine hand. But if thou fear to go down, go thou with Phira, thy servant, down to the host. And thou shalt hear what they say, and afterward shall thine hands be strengthened to go down unto the host. Then when he went down with Phira, his servant, unto the outside of the armed men that were with the host. So, first of all, you know, Gideon was a little afraid here too, because he took Phira with him. You know, the Bible says, you know, hey, if you're afraid, take Phira with you. Don't go by yourself. Take Phira and go down to the host. So he goes down with Phira, but he does go. Okay, he does go. He goes down with Phira, and he comes down from the mountains, and he goes right next to the army. So he has nobody with him except Phira at this point. It's just Gideon and Phira. Look at verse 12. And the Midianites and the Amicalites and all the children of the east lay along in the valley like grasshoppers for multitude, and their camels were without number as the sand by the seaside for multitude. So, I mean, there's a lot of important information in verse number 12. Number one, it wasn't just the Midianites. And that's important, I think, in this story. And you say, why? Well, I'll, I'll tell you in a minute. But it's the Midianites, the Amicalites, and all these different nations. It's all these different, you know, nations. The children of the east lay along, and then they're like grasshoppers again, meaning you, there's so many of them, you, they don't even count. So they counted 32,000. So if it was tens of thousands, you would think we would get a number here. So it's more than tens of thousands of people. It's way more than 300 for sure. Okay, look at verse 14. Or 13, I'm sorry. And when Gideon was come, behold, there was a man that told a dream unto his fellow, and said, Behold, I dreamed a dream, and lo, a cake of barley bread tumbled into the host of Midian, and it came, un 
unto a tent and smote it that it fell and overturned it, and that tent lay long. So here Gideon comes back with Fura, and here this guy that's one of these 300 tells this story about how he dreamed that this, basically this loaf of bread rolled down, like, because where are they? They're in the mountains. It rolled down the mountains into the camp in the valley, and it just, it knocked over this tent of the Midianites. Okay, and look, his fellow servant answered and said, This is nothing else save the sword of Gideon, the son of Joash, a man of Israel, for into his hand hath God delivered Midian and all the hosts. So right away they identified this loaf of bread as being Gideon. Why? Well, what was Gideon doing when the angel, when the prophet and the angel came to call Gideon? Gideon's a farmer. Okay, this would be the equivalent of if Gideon was a mechanic, if somebody dreamed a dream where they're like, Oh, I dreamed a dream that a wrench came down the mountain and, and destroyed, you know, the Midianites. So the bar, it, it was very easy for them to identify that this dream, you know, was Gideon. It, this barley loaf was Gideon. Okay, I mean, just think about, you know, a, a plumber. If Gideon was a plumber, that a, a piece of PVC pipe rolled down the hill and destroyed the Midianites. Okay, I mean, it's kind of the same thing. That's why they identified so easily with the fact that this was about Gideon. And this kind of gets everybody fired up. Because you think that, you know, there needs to be a little bit of motivation. I mean, can you about imagine what some of the people in, in the army were thinking when he just sends everybody home? How'd you like to be one of those 300 that's left over when he sends, you know, 32,000 or 31,000, you know, 31,700. Look at that math right off the top of my head. He sends them home and you're one of the 300 that's, that's left. You're like, you know, was this the smartest decision? Should we be following this guy? He's just a farmer. I'm sure there was somebody thinking that. But now they have a little bit of motivation here. Somebody had a dream. It, it, was, it was clearly interpreted to be of Gideon destroying the Midianites. And here we go. Look at verse 15. And it was so when Gideon heard the telling of the dream and the interpretation thereof that he worshipped. And he returned into the host of Israel and said, Arise. For the Lord hath delivered into your hand the host of Midian. And he divided the 300 men into three companies. Now he has a very interesting strategy here, but it makes perfect sense when you think about what they actually did. He divided the 300 men into three companies, and he put a trumpet in every man's hand with empty pitchers and lamps within the pitchers. So they have a trumpet and they have a lamp or a pitcher with a lamp inside it. So they're carrying three things, and they put the lamp inside the pitcher, because how many hands do you have? You have two, right? So you carry the pitcher and the trumpet, and they're heading down to the Midianites, and he says unto them, Look on me, and do likewise, and behold, when I come out to the outside of the camp, it shall be that as I do, so shall ye do. When I blow with a trumpet, and all that are with me, then blow ye the trumpets also on every side of the camp and say, the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. So Gideon and the hundred men that were with him, so there's three different groups of 100 men to surround the Midianites, to surround the great army. So Gideon and the hundred men that were with him came unto the outside of the camp in the beginning of the middle watch. That's important too. But they had but newly set the watch, and they blew the trumpets and break the pitchers that were in their hands. So when did they go down to the army? So there's, there's the beginning of the middle watch. So the middle watch implies that there's three watches. So there's basically three watches in the night. So basically the first watch would be from sunset to like 10 o'clock at night, if you think about it that way. And then the middle watch would be from 10 o'clock at night to roughly 2 a.m. in the morning. And then the third watch would be from 2 a.m. in the morning until the sun comes up um, in, you know, in the morning. Okay? So now, it's interesting because they go in the middle watch. And it makes the most sense that they would attack in the middle watch. Because look, if, if you go in the first watch, there's going to be you know, people that stay up late still awake. Right? There's going to be people that just normally stay awake later that are still going to be up at that time. If you go in the third watch, then you're going to get your early risers that are going to be awake. People that get up at 4 o'clock in the morning. You ever met these people? But people like that, right? Farmers get up early. Maybe Many people just get up early. I'm sure soldiers and the leaders of the army were the, some of the first people that got up early. So they go in the middle watch which means that the only people that would be awake at that time would be the guards themselves. Okay, so they're in the middle of the night. 
is when they do this. And then what do they do? They had newly set the watch and they blew the trumpets and they break the pitchers that were in their hands. So everybody is in the deepest sleep. No one's awake except the guards. And they just start making all this racket all around the camp. And the three companies, in verse 20, blew the trumpets and break the pitchers and held the lamps in their left hands and the trumpets in their right hands to blow withal. And they cried, the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. So not only did they have like an audio thing here, so they had taken the lamps out of the pictures, pitchers and they broke the pitchers, which must have been a great clamoring all around the camp. You know, and I don't know what the pitchers, I suppose they were clay or hard material. I'm sure it was just a lot of banging and rattling and, and clunking around, like probably maybe horses or, you know, uh, chariots or something like that. A lot, of, a lot of noise happening here. And then they blow the trumpets, which is, you know, another sign of an attack of cavalry, things like that. And then they have all these lanterns. So there's a visual aspect as well. So if you would wake up in the middle of the night and you hear all this racket and this screaming, the sword of the Lord. I mean, you're, you know, you're, people are screaming the word sword. There's all this racket. Trumpets are blowing like a charge, like a, you know, a call to battle. And then, you know, you have all these, all these lanterns all around, all these lights coming from the mountains. And you don't know because if you're looking into the mountains, what are the first lights that you see? All you would see was the first light coming out of the trees, the first lantern coming out of the trees. You'd really have no idea how many people were behind the first lantern. So they basically create absolute audio chaos and visual chaos as well. And they create great confusion. And look at uh, verse 21. Is that where we left off? And they stood every man in his place about the camp, and all the host ran and cried and fled. And the three hundred blew the trumpets, and the Lord set every man's sword against his fellow, even throughout all the host. And the host fled to Bereshita in Zarethath, to the border of Albemahoah, and unto Tabath. It's so easy to see how this could happen when you think about the actual situation that they're in. You know, this is what uh, von Clausewitz would call, you know, the fog of war. You know, von Clausewitz was a famous Prussian general who, who coined the, you know, the term the fog of war. You know, it's just this idea that in war, you know, there's just this huge realm of uncertainty. And he wrote books on it and things on that. And, you know, some things that, you know, he quoted on this. He says this, von, Cla uh, von Clausewitz says this, Karl von Clausewitz. He says, war is the realm of uncertainty. Three quarters, think of this, 75% of the factors on which in a, a war is based are wrapped in a fog of uncertainty. A sensitive and discriminating judgment is called for a skilled, intelligent to, a skilled intelligence to sense out, sent out the truth. So what he's saying is, in this fog, if you don't have you know, intelligence and discriminating judgment, like great leadership, he's like, it's just going to be chaos, is what he's saying. He's like, incomplete, dubious, and often completely erroneous information and high levels of fear, doubt, and excitement call for rapid decisions by alert commanders. If you don't have those things, you have chaos, and that is the fog of war. Now, people have tried throughout history, military leaders have tried to overcome this throughout history for thousands of years. Thousands of years. Dwight D. Eisenhower. President of the United States and a, and a great military leader in World War II said, in preparing for battle, I've always found that plans are useless, but planning is indispensable. What he's saying is, is that you, know, you, can, you can plan and plan and plan, and then you make all these specific plans, and he's like, when you actually get into the battle, he's like, none of it works out like you thought it was going to. Because it's the fog of war, it's chaos. Okay? Sun Tzu, who wrote The Art of War, very famous book, says there are occasions when commands of the sovereign need not be obeyed. He's teaching, he's teaching in this statement here how to overcome the fog of war. He's saying there are occasions when the commands of the sovereign need not be obeyed. He's saying there's, there's times when you have to think for yourself. 
when it is expedient in operations that the leader need not to be restricted by the commands of the higher authority, when you see the correct course, act and do not wait for orders. So he's saying that to get, across the, get around the fog of war, every individual needs to act according to their individual situation in chaotic situations and not be you know, restrained by you know, these overarching commands from the higher authority. He's saying that's one way to get through the fog of war. Like, look, there was no leadership in the middle of the night when everyone was sleeping and all this chaos started ensuing. There was, it was just spontaneous chaos. And look, turn, to, turn to back to um, verse 33. No, I'm sorry, turn back to uh, Judges chapter 6 and verse 33. So there was no leadership, there was spontaneous chaos, audibly and visually, and they turned on each other. You're saying, how could 300 men defeat an entire army like this? Well, the army defeated itself. I mean, the Lord defeated the army, but this is how he did it. They turned on each other. You say, how did that happen? It's because this, they didn't know each other. They're from all these different nations. Look at Judges 6.33. For the Bible says that all the Midianites and the Amicalites and the children of the east were gathered together and went over and pitched in the valley of Jezreel. Look, it's this huge army from all different nations. These weren't the Israelites. You know, they didn't turn around and say, oh, you know, you're an Israelite. They didn't recognize each other. They're from all these different nations, cultures, and they just, they just started fighting each other because they didn't know who was attacking them. They didn't know who was who in the middle of the night. It's totally easy with you know, things that you've read throughout history to see how this happened, how the fog of war here took over. There was absolutely no leadership, and that's where the victory came from. Look at verse 23 of Judges chapter 7. And the men of Israel gathered themselves together out of Naphtali and out of Asher and out of all Manasseh and pursued after the Midianites. So the entire army fights themselves, they get into this chaotic situation, and then they run away, and now, you know, the Midianites are in retreat, and now Gideon pulls everyone together and says, all right, let's fight, let's finish them off, is what happens in verse 23. Look at verse number 24. And Gideon sent messengers throughout all Mount Ephraim, Ephraim, saying, come down against the Midianites and take before them the waters unto Bethbara and Jordan. Then all the men of Ephraim gathered themselves together and took the waters unto Bethbara and Jordan. And they took two princes of the Midianites, Oreb and Zeb, and slew Oreb upon the rock Oreb. You know, you know, I'm sure the rock Oreb got its name because Oreb was slain there. You know, sl slain there. Right? I mean, it's not like, you know, where should we slay Oreb? And you're like, oh, let's go to the rock Oreb. No, they, they, they named the rock after where Oreb was killed. Okay, same thing with Zeb. They slew him at the wine press of Zeb and pursued Midian and brought the heads of Oreb and Zeb to Gideon on the other side of Jordan. So here, the Midianites have been defeated. There's a great victory that happened. But what I want to point out in this chapter is the fact that God in this chapter tested Gideon. In chapter 6, Gideon tested God. By asking for a sign, he was testing the Lord. He was asking God for a sign. Show me what you mean. He's testing God. And in chapter number 7, it's interesting because God tests Gideon. And, and Gideon passes the test and he does what he's supposed to do, but he basically tests him twice. He says, who's ever afraid? Go home. Whoever laps, you know, down to 300 people, you know, go against the grasshoppers of the multitude, the sand of the sea, and, you know, why? I mean, go back to verse number two. Why did he do it? In verse number two, God explains why he did it, and he says, And the Lord said unto Gideon, The people that are with thee are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hands. Why? Lest Israel vaunt themselves against me. So what was the problem with Israel? Israel was under oppression. Israel was taken over by the, the Midianites and by these other nations because they had turned their back on God. And God is saying here, look, he's like, I don't, tr I don't trust you, <laughs> basically is what he's saying. He's like, I want it to be clear that when you win this battle, that it was me that did it. I don't want you to be able to say even one bit that we did this ourselves. Oh, it's because, you know, I'm such an awesome soldier, or we're great fighters, or, you know, 32,000 people, you know, beat an army of 100,000 or 200,000, you know, that's possible. And then they could say, we're great warriors. But no, God said, I want there to be no question 
unless you vaunt yourself against me. Unless you, like, basically God's saying, I don't trust you. You've turned your back on me once. You've turned your back on me, which is why I'm here in the first place. And I want you to understand that it was completely me, period, that did it. So God's telling Gideon, you're going to need to completely trust me now. Gideon was like, I don't trust you, angel. I need to see a sign. Please make the wool wet, make the ground wet, you know, burn up this, this sacrifice. He's like, God's saying, now you need to completely trust me. You didn't, you know, you need to trust me now. He requires it. He requires it. So look, turn to Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16. Testing God. The first point I want to make is that testing God shows a lack of faith. Okay, testing God shows a lack of faith. And that's, that's what it showed in Judges chapter 6. It showed that Gideon had a lack of faith. Look at Matthew chapter 16 and verse number 1. The Bible says this. It says, The Pharisees also with the Sadducees came, and tempting, tempting desired him that he would show them a sign from heaven. So the Pharisees are asking Jesus, Hey, show us a sign. Do some miracle. And he answered and said unto them, When it is evening, ye say, It will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning it will be foul weather today, for the sky is red and lowering. O ye hypocrites, you can discern the face of the sky, but you cannot discern the signs of the times. A wicked and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall be no sign given unto it, but the sign of the prophet Jonas. He's basically predicting his own uh, death here. I'm not going to go into that. But, and then he left them and departed. So Jesus basically says here that you know, it's a wicked and adulterous generation. He's like, you've got the Son of God standing right in front of you, and you're asking me for a sign. He's like, you're a wicked and adulterous generation. But the difference is this. Because did God not show Gideon the sign? God showed Gideon a sign. The difference is this. The difference is who's asking in Matthew chapter 16. Because these were the Pharisees. Jesus knew. Like, was Jesus doing signs? Yep. I mean, turn to John chapter 4. The difference is that Gideon believed when he was shown a sign. Jesus knew that the Pharisees were never going to believe no matter what he showed them. And Jesus didn't even want, there's, there's tons of times in the Bible where Jesus says, I don't even want them to believe. Amen. That's even a prophecy in the Old Testament. That, you know, these religious leaders, these Pharisees, he's like, I don't even want them to believe. Yeah. He's like, I don't want to show them a sign just in case there's, a, there's an off chance that they might believe. He's like, I'm done with them. So he was done with these Pharisees. Now Jesus, I mean, Jesus wasn't against showing signs. I mean, think about it. Think about how dumb that would be to say that Jesus was just against showing signs. I mean, what did Jesus do while he was on this earth? Think about it. He just didn't want the Pharisees to believe in Matthew chapter 16. But look, it would obviously be better if Jesus didn't have to show a sign. That would be the best thing. Look at John 4 and verse 48. I mean, Jesus actually says in John 4, 48, he says, Then Jesus said unto him, Except ye see signs and wonders, ye will not believe. So while God showed Gideon a sign, he, you know, he tests this faith in the very next chapter. All, look, all the miracles and everything that Jesus did, those were signs to show that he was the Son of God. That's why he did those things. You know, that's why he showed those signs, and the Bible tells us that. So look, the lesson here is this, that as your faith grows, it will be tested. Amen. So Gideon had weak faith in chapter 6, and he obviously grew into this role in chapter number 7, and, you know, the signs helped him with that. But look, you will be given things to do. You will be given tasks in your Christian life to accomplish. And if your faith has not grown you will not be able to accomplish those things. It's very simple. Look in verse 9 of Judges chapter 7. I mean, this is where, you know, God actually calls Gideon to go up, to get up and, and do something great now. Do something that's seriously dangerous. I mean, he's already thrown down the altar in the middle of the night, but now he's asking them, you know what, you're going to risk your life now. Look at Judges 7, 9. And it came to pass the same night that the Lord said unto him, Arise, get thee down unto the host, for I have delivered it into thine hand. But if thou fear to go down, go thou with Fura, thy servant, down to the host. Look, Gideon didn't ask for another sign here. He just went this time. Okay, he didn't say, show me a sign again. He, you know, Gideon's on board at this point. And he goes. He had grown. His faith had grown to the point where God could start testing him. Okay, basically taking away his entire army and giving him 300 men. But here's another thing, and I want to apply this to, to you this evening as well. Look at verse number 10. Again, but if thou fear to go down, 
Go thou with fear of thy servant down to the host. One thing you need to remember in your Christian life is that you are not expected to go anything alone. In Luke chapter 2, or Luke chapter 10, I'm sorry, you know, the Bible says Jesus sent them out what? Sent them out two by two. He sent them out together. He sent them out in pairs. Look at Hebrews chapter 10. Turn to Hebrews chapter 10. You are not expected to go anything alone in this Christian life. You know, the Bible says, you know, I mean, if, I mean, even God gave that option to Gideon. He said, look, if you're afraid, take Fura. You know, go two by, go, go two, by two down there. Go the two of you down there. Look at Hebrews 10 and verse 24. The Bible says, and let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to what? Unto good works. So we're there to strengthen and build each other up, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. You know, once again, not being alone, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another. That means building one another, encouraging one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. And so much the more as it gets worse and worse and worse. So you're not expected to go anything alone. You're supposed to gather together because you're going to need to encourage each other. Because you're going to need each other. Do you remember the first time you went soul winning? Do you remember the first time you went soul winning? Do you remember the first time that you had this idea that you would actually walk down a street in public with a Bible? Amen. Do you remember that feeling? On how, like, I'm actually going to walk down this street with a Bible and I'm going to knock on strangers' doors with a Bible. Like... <laughs> Well, I mean, didn't we all have that feeling? Wasn't it? I mean, look, soul winning, and don't forget this, especially when new people come to church, new people get saved, new people want to get into this Christian life. Don't forget how terrifying the idea of soul winning was at the beginning. It's normal. You all went through it. You all went through it. But guess what? That's why, that's why when you see these people, you know, at maybe a conference or something, and they're like, yeah, we don't go to church. We just watch YouTube. But we're going to start a soul winning ministry in our town. It's like, no, you're not. You're not going to start a soul winning ministry by yourself. Or when you're the only one in your church that goes soul winning, you're, that's going to last like a month, if you're lucky. You know why? Because soul winning can be discouraging at times. It can be terrifying at the beginning. And you know what you need? You need people around you to exhort you. You need people around you to build you up. Look, when you have brothers and sisters in Christ and you know, you're all going together and it's something that you're doing you know, as a team, as, as Christians together, two by two, look, a bad day soul winning is just a good day of fellowship. That's what it turns out to be. You know, I mean, and the, you know, of course, the, the fear of it goes away as you realize you know, just the, the benefit of it. But look, this is the power of relationships in a church is what 10 you know Hebrews 10 24 and 10 25 is talking about it's talking about this this power of all of us to to build each other up Amen. And, and look that's that's why it's important that these relationships in this church are good I mean you say I talk about culture of the church a lot and that we're inclusive, and that you know, we're always you know, building each other up, and, and there shouldn't be strife in the church, and all of this preaching about all this kind of stuff, you know, the Bible stuff about relationships. But look, that's super important here. Because if there's strife in the church, or there's gossip in the church, or there's sin in the church, or whatever, I mean, that's going to that's gonna, that's gonna lessen the effect of us being together and being assembled and being this force to exhort each other. It's going gonna, it's gonna to break that. It's like a bearing with a bad bearing. You know, it's going gonna, it's gonna to grind as the, the shaft. Maybe it's a bad analogy that only, you know, the guys get. But the point is, is that, you know, the machine needs to be working in harmony. That's why the Bible has so much to say about relationships in a church, relationships between brothers and sisters in Christ. Look, so we need to make sure that our relationships with each other are good and that we're working to do things for each other and keep those friendships and these, this fellowship you know, healthy in this church because we're here. Because look, if there's strife in the church and you say, well, there's strife, I have strife with this one person, but 
I get along with everybody else and that person and me and that person. If there's strife like that, that means that there's at least one person who, who's, who's going to feel like they don't have a fura to go with them. And that means one person will be isolated. And everybody should have a fura to go with them. Everybody should have somebody that can strengthen them. That they can, they can come here on a, on a middle of a week service and be strengthened by their brothers and sisters in Christ. Nobody should feel isolated. And then that is what Hebrews 10, 24 and 25 is talking about. That's why it's so important, the relationships in the church. Okay, so that's the first thing. You're not expected to go anything alone. The second thing is this. If you're not growing, like Gideon from chapter 6 to chapter 7, you're destined for failure at some point. Right. Please don't misunderstand this. If you're not growing in this Christian life, that you are destined for failure. It's just a matter of time. We talked about this a little bit on Sunday morning as well. Because the challenges to that faith and the things that God will put in front of you, they lie ahead. Remember Sunday morning sermon. There's trouble that lies ahead. There's trouble that lies ahead, number one. And then there's battles that lie ahead. So you say, oh, I can get through the troubles. But look, you need to be able to, to get to the battles, too. You need to be able to get through those battles. So there's, there's, there's no, and look, I hate to break it to you, but there's no treading water in the Christian life. There's no, I'm just going to stay about right here. It doesn't work. There's either moving backwards, turn to Luke chapter 9, or moving forward in the Christian life. That's it. Because as you get stronger, more challenges and more responsibilities will be given unto you in the Christian life. Look at Luke chapter 9 and verse number 62. That's why Jesus talks so much about pushing forward all the time. Look at verse 62 of Luke chapter 9. And Jesus said unto him, No man, having put his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. He's saying, look, once you start, once you start and you say, I'm going to do this, if your faith isn't growing, he's like, you're going to fall out. You're going to fall out of the Christian life. I mean, it's either backwards or forward here. That, that's, that's pretty much it. Now look, this is either, this news that I'm telling you right now is either really good or really bad. That, you know, it's either backwards or forwards. You're like, okay, well, you know, depending on which one you choose, I mean, look, it's good. It's good if you're growing and you're doing great things. You're building strong friendships all along the way. You're going to do some great things. But here's what's bad, okay? Here's what's bad. The Christian who's going through the motions, who's like, you know what? I'm going to just like, I'm good right here. I'm going to park it right here. You know, I'm coming to church, you know, most of the time, and that makes me feel pretty good, and that's about right. But here's the problem. Here's the problem. That, but their heart remains in the world. Here's the problem with that. It's not going to end well for that Christian. Because guess what? The world will take over. We've seen many times that the bad influences the good and not the other way around. And then you have that whole, like, you saved person as, you know, you're, you're coming to church, but you're not really, your heart's not really into it. You know, the Bible says that, you know, look, you have that whole chastisement of God thing to deal with. Don't forget about that. I mean, a saved person still in the world makes literally no sense at all. It makes no sense. It's a stupid position to be in. Because if I'm a saved person and I'm hanging around with a bunch of worldly people, think about this. These people are not operating under the same rules that I am. Because I have the chastisement of God on me, and they do not. I mean, what am I doing to myself? I mean, it's dumb. Why would you ever do that? And here's the thing. They'll get, they're not playing by the same rules as you. They're not going to be punished like you by their heavenly Father, and you'll endure all the punishment. But that's why, that's why the Bible teaches separation. That's why the Bible, it's for your own good, folks. It's for your own good. I mean, we've talked so much about separating from family. You know, you need to maybe separate from old friends, too. I mean, talk about dropping old friends. Look, if you're trying to change your life, you're probably going to need to drop all of your old connections to the world. Amen. That means your old friends. It might mean some or all of your family. I mean, these are hard words. 
You think about, but look, you have to do it. Look, if, if you're getting it right, look, if you're getting yourself right, here, look, I got some experience here. Let's talk about old friends. If you're getting right, your old friends aren't going to want to be around you anyway. Your old friends aren't going to want to have anything to do with you. Because you know what? I mean, think about this. Think about drinking as an example. Nobody who's drinking wants somebody around them who doesn't drink. Nobody. Because you know what friendship to the world is? You know what friendship to the world is? It's, it's validation of sin. That's what it is. Friends in the world, and let me tell you something, you'll find out who your friends are in a hurry. You'll find out what real friends are in a hurry. Because people who are in sin, you know what they want? They want you to be in sin with them so they can validate themselves. They can care less about you. That, that's how it works. So, I mean, why in the world would you ever want to be in that type of friendship? It's not friendship. It's sin validation is what it is. You say, but you say, oh, but it's uncomfortable. I, I've known these people for years. Well, you think, you think attacking an entire army of hundreds of thousands of people was comfortable with 300 men and a trumpet and a pitcher? You think that was comfortable? Think about the tests that, that people in the Bible went through, and then you think about how silly some of these are, things that we can't do are. I mean, like, do you think you will ever do anything great with your life if you can't do something that's slightly uncomfortable? I mean, think about that. Just do this. I've, this is a term I learned a, a year ago or so, especially lately with the cancel culture. Just ghost them. You ever heard about this? You just ghost them. You're like, what's that? It's like you have like a friend and you just like, you, you just stop talking to them. You don't say goodbye. You just stop. You just, you just cut your accounts. You just get away. And you just stop. You just ghost them. It's like you just poof. You're just gone. You just ghost them. Look, you couldn't ghost somebody in, in Turtle Lake, North Dakota, right? Because there's like four people that live there. But you can ghost people here. You could stop talking to somebody. You could move across town or whatever. You'd never see them again in these cities like this. Change your phone number, move, whatever. Unless your friends are in the mafia, your worldly friends, it'd be pretty easy to get away from worldly friends where we live right here. All right? Start a new life. Make your friends here. That's what it takes. Because guess what? You will have real friends here. Head down, head down to the valley and win some battles. That, that's what it takes. And you're like, I can't because it's slightly uncomfortable. You're going to have to do some things that are more than, than slightly uncomfortable if you want to win some battles in your Christian life. And then, uh, just trust me when I say, I promise you, if you can do these types of things and you can separate the way the Bible says you're supposed to, and you can have these uncomfortable conversations, or you can become the ghost, or whatever, I promise you, you will have moments where you'll be like, I can't believe God used me to do that. I have, I mean, I, I have moments like, I'm sure all of you have moments like that all the time. I can't believe God use me to do that. Because you know what? You're like, I can't. I'm not smart. I'm not well-spoken. Well, I don't know. Guess who else wasn't well-spoken? Moses. You know, I, you know what? God uses people who, who don't have ability. So you can see that it's Him, not you. God uses the weak to do the greatest things. You're like, man, I, I just don't think I have any ability. I just don't think I'm smart. Well, God's going to use you to do great things if you do what the Bible says you're supposed to do. Amen. Period. I mean, it's very simple. These are huge lessons that we can learn from a farmer named Gideon who destroyed an entire army with 300 people. And he went down first to that army with one guy. That's, I mean, look, that's really the story of Gideon. Is God using somebody that was low to do something great? He used a small group to win this great battle. So it doesn't matter how big you are. 
It doesn't matter how talented you are. It doesn't matter how weak you think you are. If you can do what the Bible says, if you can separate, if you can get into this Christian life and start putting your heart here, God will use you to do great things. I mean, raise your hand if you want to be a loser. Nobody. Nobody wants to be a loser. Everybody wants to do... Raise your hand if you want to do great things for the Lord in your life. Raise your hand if you want to do... We're not going to have an altar call. Don't worry. But my point is this. My point is this. My point is that everybody wants to do these things. Everybody in their mind... I always ask the question, you want to waste your life after somebody gets saved? Nobody ever says yes. But the thing is, it, you have to be able to make some actual moves in your life. You actually have to do something different. You actually have, when your faith is tested, you got to pass the test. Like Gideon did. Gideon went. He was afraid. You don't have to like it. Hey, when you're making that phone call and saying, hey, you know, I'm just, I'm done with this. I can't do this. I can't go to that anymore. I can't go to this thing anymore because this, this, and this, and whatever, sorry, all this, you know, I'm not sorry. But, I mean, if you do have to make uncomfortable situations like that happen, that's, that's going down to the army. Those are tests you have to pass if you want to do those great things and you want to be used by God. You just have to do what the Bible says. And if you can change your life, look, here's the big thing. No one will do it. When it comes to actually making a move in their life, the vast, I don't want to say no one, but the vast majority of people will not do it. But if you can change your life, you will change other people's lives. And that is the whole point of the Christian life. Is God using you to change other people's lives. But you have to change your life in order to do that. Just do what the Bible says. Have faith. God's correct. Don't worry about it. He's correct. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.